Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for another Paramount and Liquid Specialty Beverages Virtual Masterclass. My name is Nick Barlow, and like many of you, I'm dialing in from lockdown at home. I'm here to talk to you about all things wine. Today, we'll be taking a virtual walk through Australia's most lauded and celebrated wine region, the Barossa Valley. We will be looking at everything other than Shiraz and discussing how the deep heritage of this region is shaping and influencing the future of winemaking and viticulture in the Barossa Valley. Before we begin, I'd like to convey our most heartfelt wishes to everybody who is currently in lockdown, especially those who have seen significant reductions in their work hours. These are challenging times, and at Paramount, we experience the exact same ramifications of these extended periods of trade restriction. If any of you are experiencing hardship, there are an array of wonderful hospitality businesses and, and charities offering support, counsel and essentials. Please reach out to your colleagues and the wider community and we'll hopefully weather this storm to be open again soon. Today, I'm joined by a number of very special guests, people who live and work in the Barossa Valley. Alex McKenzie from Saltram, James Linda from Langmore Winery, Michael McIntosh representing Grant Burge, and Theo Engela from Chappie Brothers Wine Company. We have hand-selected brands and people that are woven into the intricate fabric of the wine region that put Australia onto the world stage. And most of you have in front of you some of the most outstanding wines that highlight the diversity that the Barossa Valley has to offer. I'd like to encourage you all to post questions via the question box on your page. We will endeavour to get to as many of these as possible, uh, as many as time permits, later on this afternoon. We will also be outlining to you some fantastic promotional opportunities, as well as a prize pack that we will be giving away to three lucky winners today. So stay tuned to the end for your chance to win four bottles of some delicious Barossa Valley wine. Inside your tasting kit today, you'll find a QR code on the tasting insert. Everyone who has registered for the event will receive a notification in regards to limited time offers. Simply follow that QR code. We're all getting very good at using these. And you'll be directed to the Paramount Liquor login page and then onto some limited offers. Before we kick off, we'd like to gauge from our viewers just how familiar you are with the Barossa Valley. Simply respond if it is new to you, if you know a little bit about it, or if you know a lot about it, or if you consider yourself an expert. So it seems that a lot of you know a little bit about the Barossa Valley, and we're here today to help you extend your knowledge and understanding of Australia's greatest wine region. As discussed, we've got four really intelligent brains who live and breathe wine from the Barossa Valley, and today we're going to kick off things with Saltram, who have over 160 years of viticultural heritage from uh, their time in the Barossa Valley. Joining us from Saltram is Alex McKenzie. Alex, tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit of the history of William Salter and family. 
Thanks, Nick. Um, yes, and uh, welcome to all the viewers there. It's um, great to be here. I actually started uh, with Saltram in 2001, uh, working with Nigel Dolan. Uh, there's actually only been uh, 10 winemakers at Saltram uh, over the 160 year history. And um, I'm number 10, and I was working with Nigel, who's number eight at the time. And his dad um, was also a winemaker. So I've been making wines. Uh, with, I started with Nigel, um, and I pretty much took over from uh, took over as a Saltram winemaker in 2017. Uh, I uh, have been making wine since '96. Um, I travelled overseas, uh, working in in uh, in Barolo in Italy, in, in uh, County, and also in uh, France, um, with Chapoutier. And uh, I've sort of started with a viticulture and a winemaking degree. I guess uh, Sultan for me is uh, such an important part of uh, you know, the Brossa. They, they were the earliest settlers or, or some of the earliest settlers in the Brossa. Uh, William um, and Edwards uh, said that uh, Sultan is in 1859, that's 160 years. And uh, I guess uh, set a course of, of making and really, you know, focusing on, on you know, wonderful Shiraz and other varieties. Uh, even though the number one Shiraz was the first one, which was uh, bottled back then, there's actually a lot of other varieties, um, especially Grenache, which um, have been really important to the Brossa. I guess that was a variety planted primarily for, you know, fortifiers, for ports and tournaments. Uh, I had a, a bottle there of a, like a, an 1851 show tawny port where, you know, on the back there, it's sort of a blend of Grenache, Mataro, Carignan. So it's a real sort of privilege to be able to work with some of these older vines, uh, which still exist in the Brossa. Um, and it's great to see such a, a, I guess, a demand and resurgence of, of Grenache in, in the Brossa Valley and other regions. In 2019, Saltram celebrated 160 years of winemaking expertise. What were the original varietals that were planted in 1859? Yeah, I guess the, there's um, the varieties that we had, there was sort of Grenache was predominantly, uh, Mataro, Carignan, uh, in the, in under Saltram. Um, we had a little bit of Dolcetto, Shiraz, and uh, I guess it wasn't until later on where, um, mainly, it was mainly for fortified, so it was mainly for, for you know, sort of, uh, tawnies and, and wines and, and that time where they were used for, for traveling and, and they were fortified in spirit. Uh, and that's why we've got such a great collection still um, of these varieties planted in the Brossa. And it's not many places in the world where you can actually see these old vines uh, still exist today. So, you know, to have, um, although we don't have any from the existing 1850s there, um, there are some extremely old vines planted. And, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate to sort of look after a single vineyard in Tanunda. And that uh, is, that was planted in 1935. So we call that in the Brossa uh, survivor vines. Um, there's actually a, a charter where um, the Brossa sort of uh, took the old vines and, and survivor vines and then centenarian vines. So, um, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have a list of, of old vines that we, we have access to. Um, which is which is so fortunate um, to, to actually you know sort of work with these and um, I guess with this single vineyard wine um, it comes from a, a little a little um, vineyard in, in Tananda and um, uh, you know every year it's it's what what you get you know what you're given so um, we've really sort of spent a lot of time in detail really working with the fruit and the grower and, and trying to make sure that we optimum, optimize the flavor and that. The final wine is, is you know, what you're getting is tasting a real special part of of, um, of uh, Barossa and, and, and history. So, we're really fortunate today to be able to be trying the Saltram uh, winemakers Grenache. I believe that we actually managed to secure the last of it just to offer to some of our customers. What is inspiring the winemaking team to explore these alternate varietals? And how does it differ from making uh, your world-famous Shiraz? I guess, um, I mean, we're always excited about Grenache. And, and as winemakers, we've always really loved making Grenache because it's such a fragrant variety. It's, it's a challenging variety um, in the sense that, you know, can, you can actually sort of adapt it to different styles, which is, which is great. 
um, but to keep it true and keep it varietal and keep it regional is, is really important. Um, I think, um, you know, the Grenache that, uh, you know, we look at here, um, as it's a single variety, I don't sort of, you know, you're not blending it with other, other components. Uh, you have to try to make that wine as it is and represents the, the season. And for me, um, you know, you're always waiting for that flavor to build and you're waiting for some of the, um, you know, the aromatics, but the flavor, the richness, um, you want to sort of sometimes agree. So it's always a variety which you leave on until uh, towards the end of the season. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, you, you're waiting for a long time. Um, you don't get much on there for these old vines. They're very small berry, they're concentrated. Um, the fruit is hand-picked. Um, and it goes through sort of like a bit of a gully there, but it's on a, on a sort of a southwestern aspect. And uh, we go through on a regular basis, tasting the fruits and making sure that when we're going to harvest it and when we pick it, it's going to be, uh, you know, at its best and at its optimum. So I'll, I'll usually, um, with this wine, sort of usually a bit of whole bunch as well with it, which um, I don't like to use too much, but there's usually a proportion, usually uh, that 15, 20%, where we actually... Uh, Put a whole bunch uh, of, that, of those grapes in with the ferment, um, which has been crushed or a whole berry. So it just gives a, another uh, dimension to Grenache. And, and it's a sort of, um, it's a, for me, it sort of adds a little bit of uh, richness. It's sort of carbonic maceration is what we call it, where you actually uh, end up getting a little bit of confectionery and, and uh, red berry, raspberries and some strawberry and some really lovely sort of characters sort of ferments within the actual berry. Uh, and uh, Grenache seems to handle that extremely well. Uh, with Shiraz, uh, where we do that, to add little layers of texture, um, it's not as common. Um, it's probably seen a little bit more in cooler regions, but uh, we do sort of play around with a little bit um, with, um, with Shiraz. And I think for me, Shiraz, uh, you know, we, we do make a single vineyard Shiraz as well under the, um, the journal Shiraz, which is centenarian vines. So they're a hundred year old vines. Uh, and again, for me, the special part about it is, you know, the, you're looking at vines which don't have much on them as in they've got a lot of age, the root system is very deep. You're, you're picking it to express that, that soil um, and the season and that wonderful variety and to try to capture all those flavors uh, in barrel and uh, so when it comes in the bottle and gets to the consumer, that they're really going to taste the, something extremely special. That crunchy red fruit tone and that slightly more medium than full-bodied palate weight, um, it's a great foil to the richness and the bold flavours that you'd expect in Shiraz. What decisions are being made about the future directions of the winemaker's range? And are there any other interesting varietals that we can see coming out of Saltram in uh, the next couple of years? Uh, I think, um, yeah, I agree with that sort of, you know, that always with Grenache, you're not going to get always the same density of colour and, and um, I guess as you will with Shiraz. Uh, it'll always be a bit lighter, but you can, you know, depending on how you want to make that wine, you can make it a little bit more savoury or you can make it get more juicy or you can make it you can sort of release a little bit earlier so it can be um a fresher style for me it's about sort of um you know i put it into a large oak format which is a punchins and vats um so i don't want to sort of impart too much of the oak aroma uh or the oak tannins i want to sort of try to uh, ferment that sort of grenache until it's dry uh and then we pretty much press it out straight into to punchins uh and then it stays there on lees and that, that actually adds a little bit of, um, you know, complexity. It gives it a bit of mid palate and you get some, some nice sort of lees sort of texture sort of style, um, sort of, you know, nuances in the wine, which then with the oak, uh, when you pull it out, it's extremely fresh and vibrant. It's some crunchy, as I said, and sort of got some nice textural sort of components, some sweet fruit. Uh, and that's what to me is uh, actually all about. So the winemaker selection, we have a Fiano, which is another variety which is really suited um, to the Barossa that uh, handles the, the warmer climate uh, as, we're, as we're moving towards warmer climates. Uh, it's, it's a variety to me which is sort of reminds me a bit of Semyon and Riesling. It, again, you can make it as a fresh style in tank where you can put in barrel and, and, and give it a bit more mid-weight. Uh, and I think uh, 
you know, we also have, uh, there's Tempranillo as well, um, which we've, we've got actually planted at this state. So at Saltron, we've got Sangiovese as well. So I guess they're the sort of alternative varieties we're looking at just to sort of see what sort of people wanted to drink. And, and as people were, you know, sort of educating their palates and looking at what's happening around the world, they wanted to taste more than just Shiraz. And we definitely want to continue making great Shiraz and Cabernet, and that's what we do. But I think at the cellar door with small volumes, we actually try to sort of release something which is a bit more, you know, why make selection something special? Uh, we do, um, you know, the Sangiovese and Fiano, um, and there's a, there's a Shiraz camp. So Grenache oh, is not an alternative variety. It's one of those varieties which has really been part of us. It's been a, a workhorse for a long time, and it's just been great for winemakers to actually sort of acknowledge and, and see that, you know, people were really enjoying Grenache. And there's some great demand and we're just coming out some great wines over the last few years. I've been winning wine awards, um, they've been winning Charlotte Show awards and really sort of, you know, pushing it up there with Shiraz and saying, you know, look at me, isn't this, uh, isn't this a great wine? So a very exciting time for Greenwich. Alex just touched on the ancient Shiraz vines that uh, Soltron still draw fruit off. Another producer that we have with us today is also steeped in similar viticultural heritage, and that is Langmile. Today we're joined by James Lindner. James, tell us about the history of your family and how they came to find themselves as winemakers in the Barossa Valley. Well, thank, thanks, Nick. Well, um, I suppose so. Our, our family came out as sort of a uh, part of the, the first European migrants to South Australia and in fact settled in the village of Langmile back in the 1840s. Um, and uh, yeah, so for, from there really our family sort of looked at sort of food and farming and um, uh, worked as butchers for many years. And it wasn't really until our father sort of uh, stepped out of that sort of business. Um, and then uh, having moved back to the Barossa, having been away for a while, um, eventually found himself um, as the general manager at a Rockford. Um, he'd worked for, uh, for um, Settlesfield for some, some time as well. And, um, and anyway, one day um, him and a few of his uh, uh, mates, or really it's like a second cousin and brother-in-law, they were thinking of starting their own winery. And uh, it was my brother Paul who'd been working out at Tarrac um, in Yorkshire had been driving past this old property that had been derelict and run down and said, you know, guys, you know, why are you thinking of buying or building a new winery when, you know, there's this incredible old uh, property right on the corner of uh, Tanunda there in the old Langmile, you know, village. And uh, why don't you have a look at that? And so that's what they did. They went and had a look at it. It had been derelict for something like 10 to 12 years. Um, there'd been other people that had come through and had a look at it and they just looked at it and just went, oh, holy Jeep is like, why would you even buy this? And then, then our family sort of came in and we went like, holy moly, what, what's this still doing here? And, and, uh, and really just went about trying to, to, to bring. So, so yeah, so we've been very fortunate to have a, acquired this old property that was at one end just called Langmile. And um, at the other end was the Langmile Lutheran Church. And actually during the First World War, any towns that had German names, they changed. So Langmile, uh, became Bill Yara and then eventually morphed into the township of Tanda. So I suppose Langmile. for us, when it comes to um... yeah, sorry, Nick. You. I was just going to say that uh, you guys right. claim to have so, the yeah, oldest. So... Yeah, I, I suppose um, you know when we. Uh, discovered this property and um, and started to do a bit more research. There were some old vines that were on the estate. They hadn't been pruned or managed for something like 10 to 12 years. Um, we'd been sort of told by one family that they were going to pull it out during the buying pool era of the 1980s. Uh, the Baross was under immense pressure to, to basically buy, um, there was like literally a, a race to the bottom where a lot of people were driving the wine industry by volume rather than by sort of quality and uh, at one stage the state government had a report that said the Barossa was um, too old, had no water, had un, um, um, had, had old-fashioned grape varieties and, um, and then started offering growers something like $1,500 to rip out their vineyards 
And this was only back in 1985, so so not that many years ago in the scheme of things. So, um, so the property here had ripped out a heap of vineyard, but had left the old cars vines because one of the neighbours come and said, "Hey, look, you just can't pull that out." Um, you know, there's something amazing about this vineyard. It's been around ever since. And, and so we did a bit of research and went to the Mortlock Library and we found that Christian Orick, uh, back in 1843, had an acre of garden. And back then, uh, the reference to vineyard by many was garden. So it was always written down as, as garden. So that original acre, we believe, still is just down uh, behind the, the winery itself, still on those uh, original Langmile um, village flats, I suppose, near the river. And that was one of the advantages that Langmile as a village had is that um, it actually had consistent running water throughout the whole year, where a lot of other villages, be it Bethany or Crondorf and so on, um, a lot of them had settled near tributaries. So, you know, come the summer, the, the water would sort of run dry. So, so when establishing these old vineyards, knowing there was no irrigation, they had to really live on their live by themselves to live on their own. So, you know, near being near a water source, one, you're able to, to keep the vines sort of refreshed and um, when you're planting them. Uh, but secondly, these old vineyards, these ancient old vines, you know, they've always really been dry farms. So by being near the near the Parra River, you know, our belief is the roots have found their way right down to the, the water table. And that's really, that's helped them to get through. So. So yeah, believe planted back in 1843, and because of that, you know, we stated that we feel it's the oldest surviving Shiraz vineyard in the world, um, and no one has come and and challenged that claim yet. And uh, so yeah, so that's how it, so it came to be. And what other heritage varietals were planted back in those days in and around the village of Langmole, close to the Para River, where this uh, this vineyard lies? So around the barrage, so like we, we've really come from a, um, a base around fortified wines. So we made a lot of fortifieds. And so anything that worked for that, so making ports and sherries. So if you look at uh, grapes like definitely, um, well, Shiraz, uh, Grenache, Mataro, uh, there's Pedro Exemenes, there's Palomino, there's Trebbiano, um, uh, Muscadels, like sort of Frontenacs. So I know when uh, this uh, originally the first winery was established here in the 1930s, it was called Paradale, and it actually had 12 fortifieds, one claret and one hock. So, you know, the game sort of changed over time. And we were fortunate too, you know, like we had visionaries um, around the region like Max Schubert, you know, who'd come back from Europe and had seen the change of the palates of the UK, because a lot of people forget you know, we were the largest sellers of fortified wines to the UK back in the 1930s. In fact, we sold more port style wines to England than Portugal. So, and a lot of it was shipped over by barrel and then they would bring it up the Thames and then they would bottle it and, and sell it over there. So when Max Schubert came back and, um, and decided he wanted to try to emulate uh, this Bordeaux style that was becoming quite popular in England, um, he actually, funnily enough, went around to try to make it out of Cabernet, but there wasn't enough Cabernet in the Barossa uh, for him to, to use that variety. So he ended up using Shiraz. And so then we saw like Mount Edelston's Shiraz coming out in 52, the year after Grange, um, and so on and so forth. That's really what started uh, the dry red sort of like um, uh, path, I suppose you could say, that the legacy that we sort of still are able to hang on to today and um, and drive the future of the Barossa wine industry. In front of us, we've got the uh, Langmole Three Gardens Grenache Shiraz Mataro or Muvedra, or commonly known as a GSM. What other incarnations of Grenache do you guys produce, or what other incarnations have you produced? So I, I know you showed the blue blue version, but this is the this is what it looks like in real life. So. Uh, <laughs> But um, so we've, we've had a, a bit of a play with this. With our first Grenache we made was back in 99. It's actually from our own vineyard down in Lindock, grown on this beautiful red sandy soils. Um, so then we started to play around. I can't remember the first year we made uh, three gardens, uh, but it was a GSM. Um, and I think a lot of this was inspired out of Rosebound, actually. I think they were one of the first to sort of popularize, popular, make it popular. And um, so that was sort of the first sort of incarnation. Since then, we've, we've made 
the three gardens as a GSM. We've made it as an SGM. We've made it as an SMG. Uh, we, deli- we thought about taking it out as an MSG, but we thought that wouldn't be very good. So um, we decided not to do that. And now we're back with the, the GSM. And, and I think it's sort of, this is very much in line with, I think, where the region's um, at. And I think Alex's uh, Grenache, you know, th- this highlights this as well. You know, as a region, we're very fortunate. You know, we've got this incredible knowledge of generational winemakers, you know, people that have been here all, you know, have, have done over 40 vintages in their time. And, um, you know, there was a time when you would look at these wines and if you could see through it and you can see the bottom of the glass, you just have to go, well, hang on a minute. We might have to chuck some Shiraz skins in with this. This is a bit light for Barossa. And, um, and I think because we've got a, a great mix of, you know, new generation uh, winemakers and older generation winemakers, like Alex was mentioning, having gone over to Europe and, and done vintages in Italy, you know, what, what's happened is my time or our time originally, when there wasn't really an export market when we were growing up, um, the wine industry was really domestically based and, and a lot influenced by the domestic market. And then as times come on and because we've become an integral part of the, the global wine scene as sort of Australia's premier wine region, uh, what's happened is you've got these people who've had the ability to travel the world, do more vintages from all over, you know, be it South America, South Africa, Europe, you know, and so forth. And then they're bringing back that knowledge and the things that they've learned. And I think what they've been able to do is look at Grenache or we'll look at, you know, varieties they've enjoyed. Um, you look at things like even like um, Nebbiolo and then you look at like uh, Gamay and Pinot Noir. Um, you know, these are varieties that are sort of look lighter in body, but they're still full. Um, and I think they're the sort of things that's inspired people. They go, oh, geez, I like these wines. You know, what can I use in the Barossa that can, that can sort of give me a little bit of um, uh, an opportunity to sort of emulate the style? And Grenache um, has just been one of those varieties that stood out. So, so, you know, when it comes to a red blend like this, you know, obviously you've got the ability to be able to use three different varieties, the different flavour profiles from those varieties to shape it as well. Uh, this is very much in the, in you know, using uh, older barrels as well. We're not, we're not wanting uh, any real oak influence. It's meant to be light and bright. So it's going to be sort of um, aromatic. It's still going to have some nice uh, texture and some um, nice tannin structure, but it's it's generous and, and uh, yeah, very approachable. The one thing that's interesting and, and to um, Alex's point earlier, so, you know, the first a bit of this harvest was in on the 23rd of March for this wine and, and more than likely it had been the Shiraz. And the last um, varieties we picked uh, was the 21st of April. And no doubt that would be Grenache because it does tend to hang on quite a bit. Do you think that we'll ever see a shift in uh, the production coming out of the Barossa whereby Grenache becomes an iconic varietal and that more producers will be focusing their energies on Grenache above Shiraz? No. <laughs> I, th- I, think, I think when you when you come from the Barossa, Shiraz is definitely king and it will continue to be like, you know, the... The runs are on the board. You know, this is, um, you know, one of the great varieties, you know, of the world. We do it exceptionally well in the Barossa. I think Grenache is definitely has a place. Um, and I think the more, there's more people focusing on it. And I think they're giving it a, a, a nice bit of air space. Um, ultimately, I, I, I think people will choose their own path, you know, and what they like. And, and that's always been the case. And I think, you know, a lot of people forget Grenache was actually the, the largest planted variety in South Australia and not that many years ago it was still considered probably the most important variety for South Australia because it was super versatile. So I, I think Grenache genuinely has a place within the sort of the, the premium grape varieties. It stands alone. Um, I think when you look at the premium varieties of Australia, you know, you're looking at Shiraz and Cabernet, um, Pinot Noir and Grenache is definitely up there. There's probably others that I I haven't listed and I'll probably get in trouble for that. Um, But Grenache is definitely uh, showing us um, really where it can be and where where it's going to. And and it's it's super exciting. It's just another feather to to the cap of what comes out of the Barossa, I think. I don't think any discussion about the icons of the Barossa would be complete without mention of the Birch family of winemakers. And today we've got Michael McIntosh, who's the brand ambassador for Grant Birch and Fact Lane Wines, joining us. 
Michael, uh, give us a bit of a rundown about your history, uh, your history with Accolade, and the history about this bloke called Grant Birch. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, my um, background is probably a little bit different to the other panellists. Um, as the brand ambassador, um, I've worked with Grant Birch and uh, for Accolade Wines over the past five years. Um, I came into uh, Grant Birch and Accolade Wines with um, the on-premise sales team and around about two and a half years ago, they created this role for me. Um, my background's really been to do with uh, hospitality, managing venues and cur uh, curating wine lists across Australia and New Zealand. Um, outside of hospitality, I've run winery cellar doors. I've been the general manager of the Sydney International Wine Competition and really kind of studied uh, wine uh, with the West Set uh, all the way up to a diploma and just kind of traveled the world and really experienced a lot of the top wine regions around the world from the Australasia to America, Europe, and really just enjoy kind of day in, day out sharing that knowledge that I've kind of garnered over the years and, and those experiences as well. So enough, that's really enough about me, but Grant Burge, I mean, is really synonymous with the Barossa. The Burge family are fifth generation winemakers and it really goes back to 1855 when John Burge immigrated uh, from Wiltshire in, in England and uh, brought his family across and settled in the Barossa. He was a winemaker with uh, hillside vineyards there and passed on that passion for winemaking and, and for viticulture to his uh, son, Meshach, um, whose name holds the, uh, the name for our top uh, Shiraz with Grant Birch. Um, and Meshach made his first wine in 1865. So really kind of steeped in tradition there. He's passed that down through the generations uh, all the way to, to Grant Birch himself. And Grant Birch Winery, as we know it, was established in 1988 and really what sets Grant apart from um, from some other producers within the uh, within the Barossa Valley is really the the great access to amazing uh, vineyard resources right across the valley so um, with that with that history over time we've required some amazing uh, properties there and it's that vine age and kind of diversity um, that really kind of sets us apart there. Um, Grand Burge itself was acquired by Accolade Wines in 2015 and really kind of gone from, from strength to strength. Um, we're under the chief uh, winemaker, of Craig, uh, Craig Stansborough. He's the kind of the new kid on the block for us. He's only been there for nearly oh, coming up to 30 years now. So um, he worked his way up um, from, from cellar hand all the way to chief winemaker and he's been at the helm um, for nearly 20 years now. And he's a, a Barossa boy through and through. So um, really has a, a great um, understanding of, of the, the vineyards in the area and, and for us is just a, a, an amazing asset there. Um, Grand Burge has always been a kind of a, a, a top rated wine. We've been Langton's classified, uh, James Halliday rated uh, five-star winery for the last 12 years. And it's great to kind of share one of the wines that is really um, kind of quite dear to us, which is the Corrington Park Cabernet today. So what kind of wines were they making in the late 1800s in the Barossa? What, what were the grape varietals planted there that the uh, Birch family had access to? Yeah, I mean, I mean, some of the vineyards that we've, we've got access to have that long-standing history of, of being up to 150-year-old, and, and the Corrington Park is, is one, one such vineyard. Um, would have looked a little bit uh, different kind of back in the day. I mean, whilst table wines kind of had had been made in the Barossa since the kind of the 1880s. It's really um, the fortified wine production that, um, that um, kind of sets the history for, for the Barossa Valley. And the varieties there, we've talked about the Grenache and Shiraz, which, um, which are integral now in making our table wines. But there's, there's varieties like Pedro Jimenez, um, the Taro, the Doradillo, the Riesling, um, which all kind of had their, their place there as well. Um, making those fortified wines, the sherries, the muskets, um, it was really, I mean, about 25% of the, uh, the wine production in, from the Barossa, um, sorry, 25% of Australia's total production was um, from the Barossa by kind of the 1920s. So it's really those, those varieties that were the, um, the workhorses uh, at those times. And 
we see now kind of with the um, that Barossa Old Vine Charter that you know the the Shiraz is really kind of uh, and the Grenache are the ones that really kind of dominate the we don't have as much old vine kind of Cabernet um, due to its kind of uh, lower yielding uh, crops and some things like the, that have been mentioned earlier, things like the vine pool, pool scheme and, um, and, and kind of different changing um, tastes over the years as well. So we've got the um, Grand Burge Corridon Park in front of us, single vineyard Cabernet. Um, James mentioned that when Max Schubert came back from his travels abroad, he struggled to find any Cabernet to make a Claret-style wine. When did Bordeaux varietals really start to be explored in the Barossa and specifically with, with Grand Burge? Yeah, I mean, even the, um, the uh, uh, Corrington Park vineyard, um, it would have probably had a little bit of Cabernet there um, back when it was established uh, 150 years ago. Um, but again, as I mentioned, like, the, yeah, it had run out of, um, out of popularity at times. And um, when Grant acquired the property um, in 1999, he actually had to, to go and set about planting um, Cabernet vines there in, in the property. And this is um, property that kind of granted um, really admired kind of growing up. I mean, with that, he knew that this particular vineyard site would, would really produce unrivaled uh, quality of, of Cabernet there. Um, Corinna Park's one of those uh, highest and coolest uh, Cabernet sites in the Barossa region and it kind of produces uh, perfect conditions for um, year in, year out, creating Cabernet with finesse and kind of depth and complexity there. So we look around about um, 150 metres of elevation. It's uh, it's kind of, it's climate would be almost similar to that, that of probably somewhere like Kunawara as opposed to somewhere comparing it to the, the valley floor of, of, um, of the Barossa. Um, the, the vineyard itself over the years has, has picked up a lot, of, a lot of accolades and it really helps to, to kind of show that, that structure. Um, the wine that we're, that we're looking at today is the, the 2018 vintage, a little bit of a transparent glass there, but um, hope you're all in, enjoying that so far. So a little bit about the vintage itself. The, the 18 was kind of quite truly dry, but um, we had amazing uh, quality because um, of water retained in the soil. It was kind of in the months leading up to, to vintage. Um, even though crops were down on the, the previous vintage, we're still kind of uh, quite good, quite good levels there. Having that dry summer, um, we had to, to irrigate a little bit, but um, having that nice kind of dry, warm summer and, and, and following autumn as well, there wasn't a lot of disease pressure. So we had, we were able to kind of to, to harvest it at the right time um, without pressure and to get those degrees of, of sugar ripeness and, and fruit balance there as well. So. This kind of this type of vintage really lends itself to the Corrington Park site. It finds itself in those those more warmer years in the in the Barossa, just still maintaining that beautiful elegance and, and purity there. Um, we ferment with a little bit of Merlot and Petit Verdot as well, and that helps to uh, and where possible, depending on the the harvest times, we try and co-ferment those as well, and really helps to to soften the palate and, and bring some beautiful perfume and, and complexity there as well. Um, as far as the, the, the winemaking goes, I mean, we're looking at fermenting in stainless steel, um, open top fermenters, we're macerating on skins for around about three weeks to, to really give that depth of, of color and concentration, but also to, to give fine tanners as, as we're aging as well. Gently pressed with, tank, um, with a basket press as well and aged for 18 months um, with just around about 25% new oak. So it's just that little, that little lick there of, of, of vanilla that you'll get on the, on the, the, um, on the palate there. So I think um, you're really kind of seeing great, a great example of that, that what Barossa can produce for Cabernet from the cooler sites. Um, couldn't really come from anywhere else. It's ripe without kind of being over the top, 
has these beautiful, um, nice uh, kind of leafy characteristics there as well. Um, fine tannins, ripe tannins, and and yeah, drinking beautifully. Um, I've, I'm having a look at that background of yours and and having a real sense of of wanderlust um, sitting in 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 Sydney here. I uh, can't wait to get back to the valley. But if you spoke about the elevation and the, and the different aspects of uh, Corridon Park. Are there any specific soil types that winemakers and grape growers gravitate towards when considering uh, Cabernet in the Barossa Valley? I think with uh, with Cabernet in the Barossa, I mean, it's it does have a, a long history there. And um, I mean, it has been planted right, a, right across the, uh, the Barossa and each different vineyard site really brings a little bit of uh, something else um, to the table. And I think each, um, I mean, the further, the further north that we're looking in the Barossa is generally warmer sites. And so producing a kind of a, a richer, fuller um, style of Cabernet. But for us, we generally look towards the, um, the southern end of the Barossa. We're looking at more of the friable clay and gravel-based soils. Um, something that, that's relatively free draining, but also can hold a, a little bit of moisture as well. Um, we're not wanting the, the, the vineyard sites to be really too fertile. I mean, Cabernet is one of those, those varieties that when in too fertile soil, um, you don't get that depth of, of concentration um, that, you, that you would when, when, the, when the vine's struggling a little bit there as well. I think it really comes down a little bit to the clones that that we're looking at, at as well. Uh, certain clones are, are suited for for cooler sites, um, especially with um, Corinne Park. We have a little bit of uh, the Ranella clone, some LC10, and these these work really well on the, on those cooler sites. Uh, that might contrast something like the uh, G9 V3 or the LC7, which work better on on those warmer sites. But um, I think at the the end of the day, it's, it's it's really um, about picking picking those right those right clones, but also yeah, managing the best that you can out of each out of each site. We're on to our uh, our last speaker, and I've I've probably put him up to fail here. He's probably down three glasses of red wine before he's had a chance to open his mouth to talk. Sorry to do that to you, Theo. Um, tell us a little bit about your story and a little bit about how the Chaffee Brothers Wine Co. came about. No problem. Thank you, Nick. And um, hello to everyone. We're not um, very used to lockdown in South Australia, so we're all getting used to that. No need to apologise. It's, um, it's always so nice to taste other wines that, um, that we may not have had the opportunity to taste recently. Um, yeah, it's a Chaffee Brothers... Uh, uh, it's basically my brother-in-law and I, um, we jumped in the deep end and started making wine with without any training and without very much, um, uh, maybe we were a bit idealistic, I think, um, just hoping that it would work out. And somehow it did. I think um, the beautiful thing about the Barossa is it's got amazing vineyards. So if you start with good fruit and you don't make too many mistakes, you can make a half decent wine. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, my brother-in-law, Daniel, he's born and raised in the Barossa and worked in and around the wine industry um, his whole life before he started Chafee Brothers. It's named after his ancestor, uh, who was one of the Chafee Brothers who started um, Mildura and Shadow Mildara. And um, it was always his intention to... to um, to launch a, a wine brand and to be involved with uh, winemaking. Um, uh, meanwhile, I'm, I'm from South Africa originally. Um, he started the winery and a year later he said, um, come, uh, come on board. And um, I'm also not a trained winemaker. So I, I kind of joined the business just more on the, to help on the business side of things, but it was just the two of us cruising around the Brasa. Um, and so I, quickly fell into the winemaking side of things. So I consider myself a, you know, a, a first generation adopted Barossan. Uh, it's, it's uh, the Barossa is the real deal. It's maybe not, not like a lot of other wine regions that are, you know, that are tourist destinations like the Barossa, but 
you know, the, the Barossa community is the real deal. Um, it, and that's been probably the biggest delight is to, is to get to know um, everyone in the Barossa. And we, and we certainly benefited from a lot of goodwill and kind heartedness from the, the people in the Barossa. We got so much um, support and help and advice um, in the early days. But basically our approach was, as I mentioned, to jump in the deep end um, and to really focus on what the Barossa does well, but just kind of um, follow our instincts as well. So we started pretty simply with just a, a Riesling and a Shiraz. And that was, um, that life was much simpler back then. Now we've got 18 wines. <laughs> so we love exploring every time you find a little vineyard uh, or a different variety and, um, you know, it captures your attention in the winery. Uh, then we, then we bottle it up as another, um, uh, you know, as another wine. Uh, but that's, that's the joy of it. So, so much variety, so much, um, so many variables. Um, but one of the, one of the great delights is, is um, just making wine in this region because the Barossa is incredibly diverse. Think about another um, wine region around the world where you can make, you know, really crisp, um, pristine Rieslings all the way through to, um, you know, powerful Shirazes and Cabernets and really everything in between. Um, that's the story for us. We've just had so much to play with. Um, so many vineyards, family, friends, little vineyards. Um, it's, yeah, that that's us in a nutshell. So we like to just put a little modern spin on things. Um, and that's what we've been doing, but really focusing on what the Barossa does, which for us is Shiraz, Grenache, Riesling. Uh, this particular wine we, we launched um, not long after we got started. And that, and it really came out of a trip to Spain that we did. Um, and that, and basically it was about exploring Tempranillo uh, because we knew that the, the Barossa has been planted with Tempranillo. So we learned a lot on that trip and we came back and incorporated it um, into our approach with this wine. Are we seeing a lot of those modern winemakers really turn their attention to the Iberian varietals? Say anything out of Portugal and Spain, things like Tempranillo, Turiga Nacional, uh, even small amounts of Graciano. Do these great varietals have a long history in the Barossa and Eden Valley? Well, no, the answer is no, really. Um, from a longer term perspective, the variety is very much, um, as James was saying, you know, it is around those core varieties that the region's known for, like Shiraz and Grenache um, and Riesling and, and others. Uh, but what we have seen is an attempt to explore the wide world of, of wine, uh, wine grape varieties, looking for other things that would be suitable in our climate, in our region, considering rainfall and, 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 um, and all sorts of other variables. Um, I guess the, the, vine, um, the vines that were planted originally was based on advice at the time and what cuttings were available. And now we have some nurseries doing incredible work, you know, really thinking um, very, uh, you know, in a very detailed way about what, what would work where. And Tempranillo was, I think, probably one of the earliest examples of that kind of experimentation, looking at the other Mediterranean varieties to start with. And it has been planted quite widely. Um, this particular wine has Tempranillo from the Barossa Valley floor sitting around 280 meters above um, sea level, as well as a vineyard up in the Eden Valley. So the Eden Valley is a subregion of the Barossa. It's a parallel valley, but it sits at a higher altitude. It's about 150, 160 meters higher and a totally different expression. Same, same grape variety, totally different outcome. And um, yeah, I think um, there has been also uh, an experimentation with Italian grape varieties, and more recently with Portuguese and even now some Greek um, grape varieties. But, uh, but really um, the story, yeah, the, I agree with James, the story of the Barossa is not gonna suddenly shift. 
these are fun um, explorations of what of what the diversity of the brass is capable of. Um, and yeah, Graziano is, a, uh, is is definitely part of that. Tempranillo, Graziano, and then of course we we call it Ganacha in this wine or Ganaca, but it really is Grenache. I think the Spanish and the French claim it as an indigenous variety. Um, so we kind of um, sneak the old French variety into the Spanish blend. But um, yeah, Tempranillo um, is a bit like Spain's Shiraz in the sense that it's the big, bold red wine. It's the, um, it's the headline act in Spain. But um, in the Barossa, compared to some of the regions in Spain that are much higher altitude, um, you know, um, it's a variety that loses acidity quite quickly as it's ripening in the vineyard. So what we need to do is um, similar to what they do in Rioja, uh, which is also lower altitude region. You need to blend it with other varieties that have good natural acidity. And that's what we've done here. So um, uh, I think probably we, we wouldn't make a straight Tempranillo. We certainly wouldn't do it every year. Um, but we can definitely do uh, this blend every year because each variety contributes something else and kind of answers unanswered questions in the other varieties in the blend. So this is Tempranillo, Grenache, Graziano. And um, I guess that, that's similar to the sort of GSM. Um, it's like a Spanish GSM. Where is the origin of the name La Conquista from? And, and what does that mean to you? <laughs> so we, we called this wine Battle for Barossa. The Barossa was actually named after a Spanish battle. Again, it was a Napoleonic battle in Spain where um, Colonel William Light, who started um, the city of Adelaide, he was actually part of the, he was advising the Spanish army against the French. Um, and when he ended up in South Australia, he went to the Barossa Valley and he said, you know, this reminds me of the Barossa Ridge, which is near Cadiz. And um, so he said, let's call it Barossa. But the thing is in, in Spain, it's spelled with a double R and a single S. And when they wrote it down here, um, they wrote it with a single R and a double S. So we sort of misspelled it. Um, but the Barossa, yeah, it's named after this, uh, this battle um, in Spain. So we kind of see this as the wine rematch of the original battle where the sort of new Spanish um, grape varieties are invading what was pretty much planted with the old guard French uh, grape varieties. At Chafee, you guys have a little bit of a lo-fi wine style and winemaking style. What is it that you guys do differently that differentiates yourselves against more conventional winemaking processes? Um, I think as, uh, we found ourselves in that position by accident, really. Um, I think we, we started making wine and, um, you know, people asked us what, you know, what finding agent are you going to use? And we didn't really know what they meant. So um, we, we didn't do any finding. Um, and we were just, um, I guess, we were um, um, hesitant in the beginning to use too much of anything at all. So we didn't add, you know, sulfur at picking or at crushing or, or anything. We, you know... Just, um, just a little bit of sulfur addition just before bottling. Um, with this wine in particular, you know, rather than trying to correct the acidity when we're harvest, we, we're, we're more comfortable now running the fermentation of this, um, of Tempranillo in particular, at a higher pH, which um, would make a, a more technically trained winemaker, you know, probably a bit nervous, but we saw this being done in, in Spain without too much worry. Um, yeah, and uh, no filtration. I think um, we're probably, we're, the advantage we has, have as a small business um, is that we can just make what we like and find, hopefully find enough people who agree. Um, you know, we, so, so we just wanted to bottle it the way it looks in barrels. So we decided to not do any filtration. Um, and I think um, another big thing for us, but that is becoming a big thing for everyone really, is being super conscious in the vineyard. Um, nobody wants to um, do anything unnecessary in the vineyard, even just from a cost perspective. But really when I say vineyard conscious, I mean 
soil conscious conscious um i think it's um yeah um my i've got a strong interest in permaculture and things like that and really thinking about the soil not as a growing medium where you just kind of pump on what you need but rather looking at it as part of the overall ecosystem and almost looking at it as an organism of its of itself um uh, i guess we don't we don't own any vineyards ourselves we work with growers the same growers every year the same rows in the same vineyards so we feel like uh, we feel a level of ownership in the vineyard but we're also working with partners who know their vineyards really well um so it's um for us we can't make um, sudden dramatic shifts but we're working with all our growing partners to to move um, more in a in a more sustainable and um, um, regenerative direction I think the, we've got some uh, yes go on, we've sorry. got some really cool questions coming through from the audience and and one I'm going to throw straight at you Theo um, what other varietals are you guys exploring or is it all top secret for the moment <laughs> well, like I said, we're really passionate about what the Barossa does do well. And um, we really like um, championing things that are, you know, um, harder to sell for some reason. <laughs> um, so we've been biding our time, but this year we finally took in some old vine Semyon. So we're working on that. We're doing a bit of Cab Franc. We've got access to the Southern Hemisphere's only planting of a German aromatic white grape called Kerner. Now, we've been doing that for a few years as a single varietal and in a sparkling Riesling and um, as a field blend as well with uh, Riesling and Gewürztraminer. And um, yeah, I think Graziano, if we could get more Graziano, I would certainly make a single varietal Graziano. I think that's one variety that's really well suited to the region. I've got a question here that I'm going to throw over to Michael because he did touch on it a little bit. Um, there are reports coming out from Wine Australia that 2021 is a bit of a unicorn vintage. What what has led them to say this and what does it mean for the output of uh, vintage 2021 wines? I think the end of the, end of the day, the um, the vintage across Australia has been very, very consistent. Um, that the the production has has been has been up and of very, very high quality. Um, and I think that's really kind of um, that's spearheading that comment there. Um, I think the uh, the total production's up a little bit as well. And um, yeah, really kind of sees us in, in good stead kind of going forward. And I'm going to bring Alex in on this one because uh, he might have a little bit more input to share with us. Um, there's been a variety of things globally that has impacted the amount of wine that's been exported from Australia, namely some um, trade uh, issues with one of our largest exporters or one of the largest markets we export to, and obviously COVID. How um, are businesses approaching those challenges, especially like Saltram? Uh, I think it's like, you know, we're having to be, you know, creative in, in how we're now selling and talking about wine. I, I think, and, you know, this is an event, for, you know, for example, where, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, you know, three years ago, it wouldn't have happened. Just, and now it's actually more of a regular occurrence where we're trying to engage with our customers and, and try to educate, um, you know, consumers on on what we do in a, in a different medium. So, I think, um, you know, there's some great people doing some creative sort of, you know, selling and, and, you know, explaining and storytelling. And I think that's a big part of, you know, what the Grosser does well in other regions where you can actually take your wines elsewhere and, and you know, really transpose uh, what you've been making to other people. I mean, these little sort of, you know, pouring, um, you know, tasting sets and things like that. Um, it's, it's what you know, we, we have to do and we, we enjoy doing it. And I think, you know, getting the wine in front of everyone is usually at the end, at the end of the day what we, we need to do and, and tell our story. And I think there's some great stories to be told. Um, and I think, there, you know, there's new consumers coming through and wanting to learn about what's, what's happening in 
Uh, not only overseas, but you know what's happened. I mean, the 2021 was a great vintage for for many varieties, uh, and you know, I guess off the back of a couple, you know, harder vintages where it was a bit drier. Um, and the yields a bit lower. It's it's great for the farmers to to reap rewards of 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 a, of a good year. So um, um, definitely, I think there's the wines now that we're making. Um, we're gonna there's some great wines, uh, and it's now you know for us to to you know really you know go through and and show people what we've made and and explain and and you know try to get to those consumers and and doing it in, in ways where. You know, we, we are locked in, but we're trying to share our story with everyone. So. I'm going to throw the last question over to James. Um, everyone's kind of touched on the fact that they source fruit from growers. How many, like, growers are there in the valley? Do they outnumber the amount of producers, or are we looking at people selling fruit to one another? So, um, so in the Barossa, we're lucky enough to have something like uh, 550 families that still grow grapes for a living. I think that's one of the strong and uh, strengths of the region is that, um, you know, you can still be able to afford to go and buy a tonne from a local grower and start making wine in your back shed. You know, I think this is one of the things, you know, that I, I think really equal. You don't need lots of money to come to the Barossa and start to make wine if you, if you love making wine. Uh, the other really exciting thing about the Barossa is that, you know, you can be 14 and be learning to make wine at high school. So they've had, you know, winemaking programs at both high schools at the Barossa now for some time. And, um, you know, we've seen a lot of moves too from growers who've been primarily uh, primary producers that whose children now are starting to make wine from the grapes that their parents and or their grandparents have, have made. So, it, 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 honestly, it, I think it makes for a little bit to what Theo was saying, you know, before about the Barossa being, you know, a genuine community of people that do uh, come together and work for a common good for everyone. And, uh, you know, for when people do come to the region, they want to have a bit of a dabble. There's people out there prepared to give them a go and sell them a tonne or, or more. Um, obviously, with a bit of time, um, people get to know what, what sort of you know where you want to source your fruit from and and some of these relationships with the wineries and growers have been going on for generations so um and they're very loyal to that as well so yeah we, i think we're very fortunate that we have a good mix of you know of local families that still grow grapes are living across the sort of the, the breadth of depth which is the process I think it's a great testament to all of you because in um, dealing with you individually in the lead up to this event, you you, you all seem to know one another and, and collaborate across different platforms and, and you've made it very, very easy for us to bring a panel of very, very different people but very well-versed uh, wine experts together. So thank you for that. Um, I also want to touch on the fact that our good friends at Curative are the ones that put together the samples and I think that with these ongoing lockdowns, we're probably going to see more of these small packaged wines going out to people to host these kind of virtual tastings and, 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 and kitchen tastings. Um, and I think it's a really great testament to the fact that we're, we have the ability in Australia to really be nimble and shift our focus to be able to accommodate some of the constraints that are, that are upon us. Um, I Nick, personally feel that this state... Sorry, Nick, if I go, can... Go ahead. Say if I can say one thing too, uh, when you pour out 150 mils for a tasting, it genuinely feels like it's you're in the Barossa, you know, because that that is a good tasting size. I think it's very generous. So, well done. I think um, I think we comprehensively covered everything that the the valley does beyond Shiraz and and how diverse and and, and interesting each of the producers are that we've got. Um, it's obviously proof that the valley is bigger than just Shiraz and there is room for another Barossa Valley expression on, on most wine lists, especially at a pouring capacity. Um, I challenge a lot of venue operators, why limit yourself to one Barossa Red, knowing how well it will do if it is a Shiraz. Uh, most bars stock many different mezcals and, and whiskies and flavoured gins. It's probably something that we should we should definitely look at doing, especially representing all of you people um, and representing Australian businesses. Thanks, everyone. Um, please don't forget to scan your QR codes to see today's limited offers from 
Saltram, Langmile, Grant Burge and, and Chapey Brothers. They've been very generous in being able to support our customers. In addition to this, we're going to be picking three random winners from today's session to take home a pack of four bottles of each of the wines that you've tasted. And in, a, in no particular order, those winners are Dylan Johnson from New South Wales, Isabella Riley from Victoria, uh, we have Craig Lewis from South Australia. Uh, for those in New South Wales and Victoria, you could contact Paramount. Uh, Craig, you can just get in your car and drive up to the Barossa. No, you can't do that at the moment. So if all of you could po- contact uh, the Paramount socials via Facebook or via Instagram to uh, claim your prizes, um, please be advised that we're, we're extremely challenged at the moment with shipping across all three states. So we will keep you up to date with when and where you'll receive your goods. Um, But finally, and I mean this when I say it's finally, uh, I want to let you all know that we're offering an extremely exciting opportunity for five of our customers uh, from Paramount Liquor to win a trip for two people to travel to the Barossa Valley. Uh, And that obviously is when we're permitted to travel. Um, The package will include Visits to all of our friends at uh, Yolumba, Saltram, Langmile, Chafee Brothers, um, and a, a really great immersive experience where you'll be able to taste in the in the Barossa Valley, but more importantly, you'll actually be able to meet people face to face, so beyond a computer screen. Uh, for your opportunity to enter into the draw to win one of these five packages, where you'll be hosted by an expert through the entire time. Uh, please log on to Paramount Liquor and you can purchase any of the red wines that we're featuring uh, from the Barossa Valley anywhere between the 26th and the 31st of August. That's the 26th of July, 31st of August. Um, These winners will be chosen at random. Um, So please jump on there and support some of the greatest producers in the country. There are full explanation about TNCs on the website. So guys, I really want to thank everyone for participating, but most importantly, I want to thank our special guests. So Alex from Saltram, James from Langmile, Michael representing Grant Birch and Theo from Chafee Brothers. You guys have been exceptional compares and contributors to a great discussion here. Thanks for all of your insights and stories. Uh, But more importantly, thanks for some really good juice in glass. I think it's been a great opportunity to look at the wine side by side, but more importantly, to gauge a deeper understanding of just how much effort you all individually put into crafting these great wines. If any of our viewers have any questions, please reach out to our customer service managers across the country um, or our wine specialists, which I am one of them. We are on hand to help you, guide you in and your customers, no matter how big your venue is, with a comprehensive consultation and advice around your wine programs. We offer an independent voice and we are invested to ensure that your business succeeds. So with the lifting of the lockdowns in the next couple of weeks, please reach out to us. We haven't been doing much um, and we're looking for some really great opportunities to get some runs on the board for some really great Australian producers. Thank you everyone for your time and we look forward to hosting you in our next event, uh, which will be a craft beer tasting all about the hops. So get on the website and register for that and please everyone stay safe and stay at home. Cheers.